All right. Does anybody in here or online know what it means to be denozoed? No. Ah, somebody does. Yep, there Randy's doing it. He knows. A few of you do. Okay, there is a TV show online, I mean online, on, on TV, and it's been on for many, many years, okay? It's called NCIS. My husband has to come read my words. He's, he's no. worried. <laughs> Oh, okay. I know what, what, what it is, is there's a, there's a character on the show, and his name is Tony Dinozo. And whenever he does or says something really stupid, his boss, Leroy Jethro Gibbs, will come up behind and go boop and smack him in the back of the head, okay? So that he will wake up and realize that he had done or said something stupid, hi, baby, <laughs> and that he needs to get it right. It needs to change, okay? He needs to wake up. Well, this week, I got denozoed by God. Let me tell you what. At the very beginning of the year, most of you guys know I have a jewelry store, okay? I own, I have over 3,000 pieces of jewelry. I own a jewelry store. My whole house is full. Well, <laughs> Pastor will tell you. All right? At the beginning of the year, um, God really started talking to me and working with me and telling me I needed to give up my jewelry store. And I'm like, but God, this is what supports us financially. This is what supports my daughter financially in um, Nashville. Every penny I make goes to her. And he's just like, no, you need to give it up. And I kept saying, no. I didn't want to give up my friends that I've made. I have a huge team under me, and um, I've got like 45 people under me, and I didn't want to give them up. I, I was dreading telling them, and I felt like I was going to let them down. I didn't want to lose the sisterhood that I had with my team and both my upline and my downline, and it was just absolutely killing me. And God kept telling me, and he kept showing me in his word. I mean, it would just be right there. You not need to do it. You need to do it. You need to do it. And I kept saying, uh, okay, God, but not yet. <laughs> I wasn't ready to give it up. And finally, at one point, about three weeks ago, I guess it was, <clears throat> God talked to me, and he says, you're no different than Lot's wife. Bam. There's the first Tenozo. What? He says, you're not willing to let go of the past. You're trying to move forward and be obedient and do what I tell you, but you're holding on to the past because you're not willing to let all your friends and everything you know and all your comfort go. I kept looking back, just like Lot's wife. Ooh, let me tell you what, that hit home. I'm just like, I mean, oh, my goodness, that just... So finally, I had a, a team meeting with my team, my husband and my daughter, and we sat down in the living room, and I told them exactly everything that God had been showing me. And I mean, I'm quoting scripture, I'm doing everything, and saying this is what God said. And I thought they'd be upset. Both of them, okay, let's do this. <laughs> it's like, oh, great, you know? They knew a long time ago. They've just been waiting for me to get to that point. Well, I emailed... Uh, the company, and I told them that I was resigning and why I was resigning, you know, just I, I needed to do it, and um, never heard a word from them. And I was beginning to think, okay, did they not get my email? Well, Thursday, when I went to go log into my, uh, my website, it was gone. No boo, no hello, no thank you for, you know, me. I was, I was up there. I had, I had a good-sized team. I was up there, and I'm just like, wow, it's crickets, you know? But then it really hit me that it was done. And then I cried a whole lot. Didn't I? I just cried now. But then I went and I opened my Bible, and this is what it said. Galatians 5.1. So Christ has truly set you free. Now make sure you stay free. And don't get tied up in slavery again. Boom. Second Denovzo. Let me tell you, at that moment, I felt the chains fall off me. And all of a sudden, for the first time in about four years, I felt free. And I felt so light, and my spirit was so light. And it was like, all of a sudden, I had no problem, and I started texting everybody and telling people on my team and doing this and doing that and letting them know that it is final. You know, and I began doing things, and I just, I just all of a sudden had this amazing freedom. So, my challenge for you today is, what is God telling you? 
What has it been telling you to do for weeks? But you've been dragging your feet. And lot, like, like Lot's wife, you've been holding on to that past and you're not willing to let go. Jeremiah 29, 11 says, For I know the plans that I have for you, declares the Lord, plans to prosper you and not to harm you, plans to give you a hope and a future. What is keeping you from moving on into your future that God has planned for you? What chains are holding you back? Let me tell you what, this was not planned, but every single song that we sang today was about chains falling off and about freedom and walking out of that grave that you have been in for so long. I got on, my daughter uh, goes to another church in Nashville, and I got on their broadcast this morning. Guess what they were singing about? Chains falling off and freedom. This is God's word for you today. Pastor, guess what he's going to be talking about today? Chains falling off, freedom. This is God's word for you today. What is it that has got you chained? What are you holding on to that you're too afraid to let go of? It's time to let go. Don't wait till God denozos you. I'm your campus pastor, and I will see you in one moment. Amen. Give the glory to God. She could have kept going. I would have been okay with it. <laughs> I was like, it's like it's, it's, she just ran out of notes. She needs to write more notes. Anyhow, uh, but it's, and, and, and by the way, a bunch of jewelry is about to go on sale real cheap. The, uh, uh, so all the ladies went, yay, uh, they'll be able to do that. But I tell you, it is wonderful that God is moving in our hearts and lives and that we are seeing personal miracles. How many prayed and fasted this week? Amen. How many of you realized some miracles in your life this week? Amen? Amen? And I'll talk a little bit more about that in a few moments. But I want you to know that God is doing great things. Now, as far as a few things coming up here in the future of Faith Family Worship Center, Wednesday, Isaiah is going to be, we're going to be in chapter 45, I think. And uh, wow, we are getting deep in that one. It slowed down on us. We're trying to get through, we're trying to do a chapter a week. We can't even do that at the moment because it is so, so good. Uh, second thing is, is that the book of James in our youth group here, meeting in a sanctuary, they're going to be in chapter number one, they're going to be learning all about sin. Ooh, how, how many of you wish you to learn that whenever you were their age? right? Um, and how it works. So we're going to be teaching on that one. And they're going to be learning that as they go verse by verse. Uh, freedom class next week's the last week, but you can still join us if you want to and just learn that and get the information from us and to be a part of that 915. In Jesus' name, we'll be continuing. That's going to be our series for the rest of this month. And I'm going to be sharing with you what in Jesus' name means to you. And yes, how it can set you free. And then tonight, Super Bowl party down at Shark Shack. Now, the latest weather report said the rain stops at 2 o'clock. We'll see how this turns out. We're going to watch it. We'll watch it there. We'll watch it here. We're going to watch it, okay? And, um, and uh, so it, traditionally, I have to do this. How many are rooting for the Rams? How many are rooting for the Bengals? Okay, so... Uh, the Bengals won, they, they, so the team winning tonight will be, that, that's the one that's going to be winning. Everybody's the same way, and by the way, I was just reading uh, before I got in here, more Bengals fans will be attending the Super Bowl than Rams fans, even though it's in the Rams' home stadium. Tells you how much they love their team, right? Uh, like, mm. So, Cornell Avenue, Adopter Road will be cleaning both sides of that road on February 26, 8.30 a.m., so please join us for that and just be able to serve our community with love. So, Jesus taught us that our lives are a reflection of his heart, and we are to represent him in our life every day, that people see Jesus in us. How many of you know this? Amen? How many of you know someone you can think of right now, and they were a, the gospel of, lived the gospel of Christ out right in front of you? You saw it in real time, in real action. You experienced real love. You experienced hope from their life. And so whenever we look at that, Jesus calls us to do the same with others that are around us. And I believe that every person, every person alive has the right to connect to their creator, to connect to God, the Lord God in heaven, and to enjoy a community of faith that encourages them, one another. Every person has a right to worship God, and every person has the right to be a part of a family of God, a church of Jesus Christ. And it's no wonder that the world we live in works very hard in overtime to destroy those two concepts right there. 
to destroy the concept of worshiping God or if there even is a God and to devalue the church to the point where nobody wants to be a, be a, be a part of it. I've understood that if the world is working overtime against something, you probably should look at what it's about because it's something that God wants to give you. If the world's trying to take away the gospel, you need to be running to it. If the world is trying to take away hope, you need to be running to Jesus. And that's where your giving makes a difference. This is where your tithe makes a difference. You see, our goal isn't here to save humanity. We're not here to save the planet. And I'm not trying to trigger my environmentalists or anybody like that. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm not here trying to save the world because I read the end of the Bible and it all goes up in smoke. Amen. So the, the, what am I saving? Something that eventually will be destroyed. Uh, what I want us to understand is that we are here to save someone. We're here to save a family. We're here to save a teen. We're here to save a child. And, and, everybody, everybody's still listening, right? Still there with me? And we are, and we are to do it again and again and again and again and again. That's what the church does. This is what the church does all over the world. It's not trying to save everybody. It's just trying to save somebody and to keep repeating it and doing it again day after day after day. Faithfulness that he has called us to is a blessing, and that blessing of your giving and faithfulness and tithe and offering empowers us to be able to do so many different things to see someone saved, to see a family saved, to see a marriage saved, to see kids and teens grow up in the grace and the knowledge of Jesus Christ and to walk with him for the rest of their life and know the joy of, of having a relationship with him. Those are the things that matter, really matter in this world. And that's what we are focused on. So let's see somebody's life change today through our giving. How many of you with me? Amen. So thank you for giving online at ffwc.us. Thank you for giving via Cash App, whether you mail it in, whether you leave it in a receptacle there in the back of the auditorium, whatever, the, whatever you, you, you be there. And I said this in the morning service because we, I, I had a little time to be able to do this with, but um, it, 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 I had a pastor call me this week and he says, what do you know about Bitcoin? And I said, not very much. And uh, I said, but I do know that we probably ought to start figuring out a way to start receiving it because people are going to start tithing in Bitcoin. And he said, absolutely. He says, I think that's going to be a thing that happens. Now, I just want you to know that pastor's 81 years old, and he's already thinking down the line. He's already seeing stuff happening in the future of change that happens. I'm not asking you to give him Bitcoin. I'm just telling you, when you see it, don't panic, all right? But it is a reality that people do and want to be able to do, because eventually it's just going to replace cash. That's what it's doing. So I want you to know that God is in your giving, and it does make a difference. Father, I thank you for what you've done, and I pray a blessing upon every person's life and their finances and every their jobs. I pray that you provide for their every need, and you supply through them. We look at times that economically look like they are going to be dark, but we've been there and done that, and you were the provider then, and you are the provider now. And Lord, we know that you, we, you will see us through, and we are going to praise you now and forevermore, because Jesus Christ is our provider, not that this world, not the things of this world, we are going to give you glory and honor for it. And everyone said, and give me some amens online also. While you're there, while we're kicking off this series, we kicked off the series, I should say, entitled In Jesus' Name. But I want to take a moment. Somebody post on Facebook that we're online. I forgot to do mine and it just, just got by me there to be able to do that. But the, uh, um, I just want to say who's online here real quickly. Everybody who's online is like, oh, he's going to see me here. I'm going to see your name. Don't, don't, don't panic on me here uh, with Bonnie and Pam. Pam's up and in, in, in Pennsylvania and about this much snow. It's a lot of snow. Anyhow, and it's cold up there. Hello, Jen. And uh, let's remember Jen's, Jen's mom, and she has cancer, and we want to pray for her. How many of you are going to be praying and agreeing with me for that? Amen. Uh, for able to do that, Angela and uh, uh, Christina and the twins. Oh, they're on. Well, the dad and the rest of the kids are over here. So, hey, that's new. Good morning, Richard, and the whole family there with Myrna and all the rest of them. Uh, to be a part of that. It's good to have everyone here this morning and to be a part of this. People watch this during the week. We do replays. People watch it. And we see people from all over the world who take the opportunity. There for a while, I, don't, I haven't looked recently, but we've been a hit in Ireland. 
Not quite sure. If you're from Ireland, say hi. We just love to see, just to hear from you. Uh, that's all, and to be a, be a part of today. Uh, we we looked at Matthew twenty eight eighteen last week. How many remember that? Amen. And uh, where it says, "I have been given all authority in heaven and earth." Jesus tells us He has been given all authority on heaven and on earth. And so when we talk about in the name of Jesus, and I know we pray in Jesus' name, we pray in Jesus' name or in the name of Jesus. Whenever we do that, we, take the, we, we, we are saying that we are under your authority because you have all the authority. So when we pray, we pray in your authority. Now, Mark tells us in chapter 16 that at, he repeats that, and, and then he adds to that that we are to see and experience results of that authority in our life. We are to see and experience results of his authority in our lives. We can see it every day. We should see it every week at least. We should see it and know it. See, our goal here isn't to convince Jesus that we have enough faith. If you need more faith, Jesus said pray for it. He said increase our faith. He, he commended the disciples for praying that prayer. He said that's a good prayer. So if that was a good prayer for them, it's a good prayer for you. And if you need supernatural prayer, we know in 1 Corinthians 12 that you are going to, to be able to uh, uh, receive the supernatural gift of the Spirit. I'll go ahead and dismiss the kids this time, head back to Kids Church, because you're sitting there looking at me going, why am I still in here? And that's because I forgot and I didn't read my notes. Um, and I, I have a children's director in the back who's, who's doing jumping jacks trying to get my attention. But uh, anyhow, so they're good. But I, wa I want you to know that if you need faith, you can get faith. You, you, and if you're trying to convince Jesus that you have enough faith, you're, you're barking up the wrong tree. You see, our goal is to humble and our, submit our lives by faith to his authority. By our faith, we submit to his authority and what he has in store for us and how he leads us and what we go through is under his authority. He has all authority over health, sickness, depression, disease, death, all of it. He has all authority over heaven, over hell. It's all his, okay? So that's why we don't fight those things that come against us. We don't fight it. That's a, you see, we spend, as many people of faith spend way too much time fighting sickness, and they're fighting uh, disease, and they're fighting financial problems, and they're fighting this, and they're fighting that, and they're fighting it in Jesus' name, and we're claiming authority, and we're coming against that thing, and we're coming down on it, and you missed it. You just missed the whole boat whenever you do that because we are responsible to submit those things to someone who already has the victory over it. So we take it and we say, Lord, you are my healer. Lord, you are my provider. Lord, you are the one who takes care of me. I'm not fighting that because I'm going to lose. And some of you are in a place right now, you've been losing, you've been losing for a long time and you're exhausted. Hello. You're stressed out. And I'm here to tell you today that what I just said would set you free from all of that because you go, what? No, Lord, you're <laughs> It's your problem. I can't deal with it. I don't know what to do. I'll do what you want me to do. I will honor you. I will live you. I'll put my faith in you. But I don't know how to fix that. And when we put those things in his hands and we trust him with it, it changes everything. Many of you fasted, prayed this week. And my time resulted in addressing different areas of my life with clarity and direction. That's what I got out of it. It's what, that, was my, that was a personal miracle for me. It's something that I have been working on for months, trying to get some kind of clarity and direction out of this. And it was a, it was, I was really in this struggle. And I mean, boom, that was Monday. Man, it was just right off, right off the bat. It was just write these four things down. Boom, 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 boom. And just and all week long. Now, let me tell you this, and I talk about this in my podcast after the sermon. Uh, um, it didn't decrease the amount of stress in my life whenever he did that, it actually added some to it. But I know that the change is good and worth it. Amen. Amen, somebody didn't, didn't hear from the Holy Spirit on that one. Okay, maybe you did online. Maybe you're sitting over there going, if you're shouting at Jesus, put it online. Okay, talk to me. The, here's the deal. Whatever God does, and you say, man, that just complicates things, like sell your business, 
give up the jewelry, whatever the case is. You're going to complicate things. That's causing stress. It's worth it because you know that the change that comes as a result of it is better than the place that you're in right now. And so many people resist giving their heart and life to Jesus Christ because they look at what is being offered, but the place that they are at, they're comfortable with, they're okay with it, and changing doesn't seem to be worth it. We've got to be in a place where we let it be worth it. You say, well, how do I, how, what do I do next, pastor? Rinse and repeat. Just follow the directions on your shampoo bottle. Pray and fast. Do it again. Get in the word, pray fast, do it again, pray fast, do it again. It just keeps going. It'll compound, it'll snowball, it'll turn into something bigger and better the next time around. Now, all authority is based in something. All authority is based in something. There is, now we know from, from, from Romans 8 or 13, one of the two, the authority comes from God. How many of you know that? Say amen, okay? But all authority, if you go to a, if you go to a business, there's a boss, all right? And that boss may go over and he may look at somebody and give them a badge. And that badge has their name on it. And below that name, it'll say assistant manager. And now somebody with a badge, it says assistant manager, thinks that they have the right to tell you everything that you need to do. They don't explain anything. They're just going to start barking orders like a major general. And I can tell you from that position of authority, things are not going to go well. You, you, need to, you, you, need to, you need to move on up the ladder a little bit more before you can really have any kind of real authority. Just a title doesn't work. Well, I am so-and-so. And the response of most people is, we don't care, uh, is where that goes. So you got to move up. The highest level of leadership is actually earned. And it's not earned through promotions or productivity, but through love and compassion. If you own a business, if you are a parent, if you are in charge of a team, if, or any of those things, what I'm about to tell you is going to make all the difference in the world. Their hearts, these kind of leaders, are expressed through generous acts of compassion rooted in deep and love care for others. They care for their people around them more than they do for themselves. It's called servant leadership. Servant leaders become great leaders of corporations and of colleges and universities and churches and in politics and in medicine and everywhere else whenever they begin to care about the people about them because these people will follow these leaders to the end of the earth. And we've seen it and we know this and we know the names of the many of these people. Their authority is found in their relationship, not in their title, not in their brains, not in how big is their salary, not in how many houses do they own, but in their relationship. And that statement will change how you approach your business, your friendship, your family, everything right there. If you begin to apply that in your life, I just said, that was all free of charge. I could send you to a seminar, you pay $15,000 to find the same thing. So... Check is made at Russ, are you? Two S's. Never, never mind. So anyhow, let's begin at John 15, 15. I'm going to get in trouble for that later. Do you, do you know that, Greg? Yeah. So John 15, 15, Jesus says, I no longer call you slaves because a master doesn't confide in his slaves. Now you are my friends since I've told you everything the Father has told me. This shift in the relationship between the disciples and the rabbi, Jesus, is huge. This is massive. We've read this and read this for years and went, oh, okay. No, 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 no. You need to back up and look at this here for just a second. Because a master would tell a slave what to do without having to explain why. The master owns a slave, goes and says, do this, do that. And you understand this. Because you're going to go to work tomorrow, and your boss is going to tell you to something, and he isn't going to explain why you do it, but you do it. And you know why? Because you want your little paycheck -y. That's why. You are motivated because there's FP&L and, and AT&T and whoever else you've got to pay in order to keep the lights on and all the rest of that stuff going on. And we look here, and, and we understand it. And the problem is I see a form of religion beginning to grow in the church today that looks a lot like this. Now, some might try to call it legalism. It isn't exactly legalism here that, we, that I see happening. There are those who want to be told what to do 
but have no desire as to know why they're doing it. Just tell me what to do and I'll do it. Okay, if you do this and this and this and this, you'll go to heaven. Okay, I'll do it. And they don't want to know why that works. They want, don't even want to know who makes that works. They just want to do it. And the problem with this is that there is no relationship between them and their creator whenever they lead this kind of religion. And you say, well, why do they do it? Because if there's no relationship to fail them, then there's nobody to disappoint. We live in a world that is broken. And there's so many broken relationships and broken hearts that are around us that when we talk about having a relationship with God, it's like, no, mm -mm, nah, I'm out, snoo -hoo. I have been burnt, stabbed in the back, and I have been run over in the name of love one too many times. And I'm not doing it again. And even though people like me come along and say, that's not the same thing, it is in their minds. So they serve, but they don't experience, and that empty faith frustrates, and it disappoints. And do you really want to live your faith out this way? To say, I'm happy to be a slave and do what I'm told. Nobody wants to live their life like that. Nobody wants to work at their job like that. You'll quit and go somewhere else where you're appreciated. Nobody wants to live in a marriage like that or a family. They don't want to be in a group of friends where they're, they're always the odd man out. They're the weirdo, whatever the case is. And we, and we see this happening in our lives over and over again, and we try to apply that to our faith, and we find people that are all wrapped up in this bondage and fear to have a relationship with someone who will love them. And this is where you need to make the shift. There's a faith that hears and understands what Jesus says. There is a faith. There is a faith. Focus. There is a faith that hears and understands what Jesus says. You have to want it. Amen. You have to desire it. And down deep in your heart, you know you want it. Yeah. Down deep in your heart, there is a hunger. There's something in there that goes, there's more. There is more. But I have to let Jesus love me, and I don't want to let that happen. So you know what? I will be just content with being dumb as a box of rocks. And I will do what I'm told. And when I get to heaven, I'm going to blame everybody else because I didn't have a relationship with them. Yeah? And the Lord's going to look at you and go, mm -mm, we ain't blaming nobody around here. You're going to take responsibility for what you did. It's your fault. You didn't listen. I loved you. How did you love me, Lord? Oh, I'm there. You I don't even want to be in a room when someone asks that question with him. Jesus says, oh, by the way, I died on a cross and shed my blood and took a beating for you and your sins, and I rose again from the third day and walked out alive forevermore to ascend to the right hand of my Father so I could be here for you today. I was ready to love you. It's a level of love that adds value to you. But in this broken world you live in, you have come to the conclusion that you are worthless. And as long as you accept that lie, you'll never experience that truth. Jesus tells his disciples that his relationship with them was one of an open heart, a friendship, of great value to him. They, they, the twelve aren't that special. I know they're the 12 apostles, and thank God for them. Hello. Thank God they wrote some of the books of the Bible. Thank God that they, they did whatever they did. But if you think that they were holier than you or smarter than you or better than you, you would be mistaken. Because what he was saying to them, he's also saying to you today. As a follower of Jesus, this is the level of relationship that down deep you desire. But, but... But so many years of disappointment, so many years of anger, so many years of blaming and being the victim or the villain or whatever the case is, 
really should have come to that freedom class. That's where all that stuff's coming from. That all, all of that, all of that that we there, so much of that leads you away from experiencing his friendship. Well, I'm right here. Yeah, we go to the cross. We don't wait for the cross to come to us. We're called to worship. We go to worship. We submit our lives to him. Jeremiah 29, 23 through 24, 9, 23 to 24. Share something with you. It makes all the difference. This is what the Lord says. Don't let the wise boast in their wisdom. Now, the powerful boast in their power, or the rich boast in their riches. But those who wish to boast, boast in this alone. That they truly know me and understand that I am the Lord who demonstrates unfailing love, who brings justice and righteousness to the earth, that I delight in these things, I, the Lord, have spoken. Woo! I am the Lord who demonstrates unfailing love. 52% of Americans today think that Jesus was a great teacher, but nothing more. One half of America believes that he was a great teacher, but he wasn't anything else. He wasn't the son of God. He wasn't wasn't a prophet of God. He wasn't the savior of the sin. That's all. 66% of evangelical Christians, those are Christians who go to non-denominational churches and Baptist churches, might even be Pentecostal churches and Church of God and and all through there. That's that group right there. 66% of them surveyed believe that Jesus was a good teacher, but he isn't God. And you wonder what's wrong in the world today. If you do not believe that Jesus is the Son of God. If you do not believe He died on a cross for you, if you do not believe He rose from the dead, if you do not believe any of those things, you're done. You're toast. You can't believe a word I say. You can't believe a word you read out of the Bible. You hearing me? You can't believe there is a church. You can't believe in healing. You can't believe in hope. You cannot believe in love. You must abandon all all of it, it's gone. Because Jesus is the center, the glue to everything that we have in our hearts and in our lives. He is our hope. He is our salvation. He is our deliverer. He is the one who gives us clarity. He is the one who inspires us, empowers us. He's the one who does it. I do not know what these people are putting their faith in. I am as confused. I look at this and go, no. No, I must speak against this. I must raise my voice and say that there is a God who loves you. His name is Jesus. He walked on this earth. He understands what you're going through. And he has now returned to heaven to intercede on your behalf. This is why people are enslaved in a form of religion that denies the power of it. Paul talks about this in Timothy. When I say it denies the power thereof, in other words, you experience something religious, but you don't get anything out of it. There's no power in it. And if you're experiencing something religious, but it doesn't, it doesn't motivate you, it doesn't inspire you, it doesn't move your heart, it doesn't move your life, You need to think about who is Jesus? Who is Jesus to you? Do you want to shift your faith and experience to to what God created you to do? Do you want to move from that place where you are right now and you want to experience what God created you for? You were created to worship him. You were created to love him. You were created to be used by him. You were created to be a part of his bigger plan. You were created to change your world in his name. But nothing changes if you don't believe in it. Jesus' name means that he loves you. 
Jesus' name means he loves you. Come on. Come on. I get the feeling in my spirit, by the Holy Spirit. It's not a guess. I'm not emotional. I'm not just making some kind of inspiration here. But I just messed a bunch of people up. Let me camp out here. I got a couple extra minutes. After so long, you, th you think I'd start getting the hang of this time thing, right? The name Jesus means he loves you. But you do not want to be loved. You would rather be angry. You would rather be bitter. You would rather isolate yourself from the rest of the world that he sent you into. You would rather be greedy. You would rather be selfish. You would rather do your thing because it's going to be my way because this is what I think and this is what I'm going to do. And you need to get the word I out of your vocabulary. If you want to, how many of you would want to be in a relationship where it was all about them? And every day you got up, this is what I want, and this is what I'm going to get, and this is what I'm going to do. I don't know why I use that voice. I have no idea why I use that voice. None whatsoever why that came out. That was not my wife's voice. It is not my wife's voice. It is not my wife's voice. <laughs> Valentine's Day just got 10% better for tomorrow. I'm, I'm already in the doghouse. i got to bail out. Hey, gentlemen, just a side note here. Make sure that Valentine's Day is bigger than Super Bowl. <laughs> now, you're going to be spending the next 12 months in the dog house. So, I want, I want you to get this because when I say that the name of Jesus, it means that he loves you. It does. Well, this world isn't fair. They nailed him to a cross. He'll agree with you on that. Well, everything's all messed up. I read the Bible. It's supposed to be messed up. We're not here trying to save it. We're here trying to save someone. Someone in your world around you needs to experience the love of God. And you're the person to give it to them. But you cannot give what you do not have. Love. You will never let him in if you do not frame your life in his love. Whenever others become more important than what? Yourself. Well, the doctor said this and the doctor said that. I get it. We're messed up. Jesus is bigger than the alphabet. Jesus is bigger than disorders. Jesus is bigger than this. Jesus is bigger than that. Jesus is bigger. You see, your name can't save you. Get this, get this through. Drill in deep. Come on. And if you hit bedrock and you're not there, drill, drill, drill harder. Come on. Your name cannot save you. This is what I'm going to do. No, you can do it. And you will come up with nothing. You can do all you want to do in Jesus' name. And Jesus was nowhere in the room because you never submitted to his authority and let him love you the way he wanted to love you in the first place. That didn't make me popular, did it, Greg? No, not at all. You pay me to say it right. You don't pay me to be popular. Just in case you're wondering. Let him love you, because Russ cannot save Russ. You cannot save you. I'm going, to work, I'm going to find a way out of this. Not unless you get a tour guide. You're not getting out of it. And Jesus, and let's quote King David here for this one, even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, because your rod and your staff, they comfort me. And you will set 
a spread, a table before my enemies, and you and I are going to, this is my paraphrase, you and I are going to sit down and we're going to have a meal together right in front of everybody and everything that ever tried to destroy me and tried to destroy you and your name and your love in my life. And you will lead me to places where there is green grass and there are still waters. And you will provide for me body, soul, and spirit every day of my life. And you and me, Lord, we're going to dwell in the house of the Lord forever and forever and forever and forever. Somebody say amen. Stand with me if you would. Philippians 2.9 says, Therefore God elevated him. That's Jesus. We're talking about him. God elevated Jesus to a place of highest honor and gave him the name. That is above all names. The name that is above all names. To do what? Lord over you, manipulate you disappoint you? No. To love you. Jesus is an exactly, he's exactly in the place that he needs to be to love you the way you need to be loved. And so, Lord, I pray for everybody here and online and hang in here with me for those of you online. We have something special. Whose name are you calling? Lord Jesus. I pray. I pray that we will be a people that would repent of calling our name, calling someone else's name, calling that name or this name, on calling on all of these other names when we should have been before you and saying in the name of Jesus, forgive us for not going to you first. Heads are bowed, eyes are closed all across this auditorium and online. I want to take a moment. Have you come to a place today where you say, I need Jesus to forgive me of my sins? I need Jesus to love me, but I need to begin from the place where I give him my life. And to do that, you must say, Lord, I know I'm a sinner. I know I've separated myself from you. I know I need you today. And I want you in my heart. If that is your heart's prayer, if that's your heart's cry, just raise your hand and say, yeah, pastor, pray for me. Pray for me that I would do just that. Thank you. Anybody else? Yes, thank you. Anybody else? Online, give some thumbs up. We're going to lead you in prayer here too in a moment. Anybody else who say, yeah, that's me. I need, I need to give it. I need to let Jesus love me. I need to put his name first above my name. That is the ultimate, isn't it? That is the ultimate right there. To put his name above our own and let him be God in our life and quit trying to do his job for him. Is there anyone else who say, yes, that's me? Hallelujah. Just put your hand up, put it right back down. We're good. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Let's pray. I want everyone in here to pray with those who raised their hands and for those who responded online. Pray with me. Father in heaven, I give my life to you. I need you in my life. I need you to love me. Help me to receive your love. And in order to do that, please forgive me my sins. Forgive me for putting other things first. Forgive me for putting my faith in myself. I believe in you, Jesus. You are the Son of God. You died on a cross. You rose again. And you can forgive me of my sins. I humble myself, and I pray, forgive me. In Jesus' name I pray, amen.